So apparently I read 15 books in October, so y'all might want to grab yourself a drink or a snack or something to do, because we're going to be here for a second. What's up, friends? My name is Jess. Welcome to my channel and welcome to my October wrap up. We're just going to jump right into it because I have quite a few books to go through and I really don't want to be standing in front of my light for forever. It gets kind of hot and I'm not here for it. But before I do, I just wanted to let y'all know that content warnings for each book can be found in the description of this video. If an existing database like booktriggerwarnings.com has the book listed on their database, then I just linked that. But if they don't, I tried to list all of the content warnings that I saw myself. The warnings that are most present in the book are listed first. If you've read any of these books and think that I've missed any warning, please let me know. And if you want any more details about the warnings that are listed in the description, just message me and I'm happy to talk about it. Now let's get into the books. I started off October on an interesting note. I decided to read the original Vampire Diaries series by L.J. Smith. And I say original because I know L.J. Smith went on to write several, several books in this world and in this series. I couldn't do all of that, so I just read the original three books that from what I'm understanding was the original set before she continued on. So the books I read were The Awakening, The Struggle, The Fury, and Dark Reunion. I'm sure y'all already have an idea of what this series is about. Basically, it's a teen vampire romance series. You've got Elena, a high school girl, and you've got Stefan and Damon, two vampire brothers that she is torn between. Cue the love triangle, cue the drama. I ended up giving all of the books in this series two stars, except for The Fury, which I gave three stars to. Honestly, I think the three stars was a bit of a fluke. I think I started getting brainwashed and just enjoying it more as a coping mechanism. I actually read the Vampire Diaries books as a part of a video that I'm planning to do a little bit later in this month. Basically just a video going through some of the classic teen vampire books. So keep an eye out for that video where I go more into depth on my thoughts on every aspect of this series. That video is also going to be spoilery, so it'll probably be more entertaining for everybody. But basically, if you don't already have an existing nostalgia for this series, don't bother. Just don't don't read it. There are better teen vampire books, and I'm gonna mention one of the better ones later in this video, so just wait for that and read that one instead. I've only seen an episode or two of the Vampire Diaries show, and that was enough for me to confirm that the show is better than the book, so just, just watch the show. Don't bother with this series. I've heard from people who have both read the books and watched the show that the two are nothing alike, which I can imagine it is only good for the show. Going through these four books was honestly traumatic. It was traumatic on some level. I can't believe that I made it through all four because I really barely made it through the first one. All of the characters were pretty one-dimensional and whatever character growth did occur was really sudden and kind of unnatural. As an example, Bonnie spends the first three books being portrayed as a whip, really as a weak and sensitive character. She's also portrayed as being less than bright, which I never really enjoyed. In book four though, all of a sudden she has a backbone. She puts her foot down more and she's overall more helpful in driving the plot forward, but all of her development happens off the page in the gap between book three and book four. Bonnie is the most apparent example of this, but honestly, none of the characters have a lot of character growth and what little does happen just doesn't make any sense. It happens too quickly if it happens on the page at all. And none of them are very likable, not in the beginning and not in the end either. Elena's character is just plain annoying, so I'm not gonna get started on there. Definitely, definitely keep an eye out for that video that I mentioned because I'm gonna go in on Elena's character so hard. I have similar feelings about the relationships too. There's no natural development. There's no growth. Everything happened so quickly. Stefan and Elena's relationship literally lasted three months. I literally had to go back to the beginning of the first book because I couldn't believe the amount of things that happened in the course of this series. And I had to check when did the first book take place? When did the last one take place? What is this timeline? The timeline is three months. They went from zero to hundred so quick for no reason. And then the writing was just messy. There would be parts where something would be mentioned and I would get really confused like, well, when did they mention this? because all of these characters are acting like it's been mentioned before, but I've never heard this before. So did I miss something? Did I skim over something? Did I skip a page or something? The answer was always no. No, I didn't miss anything. Elena says that Stefan said he loves her. That didn't happen on the page. If I tried to list all of the examples of this specific thing, we'd be here for a long time. But basically the book was messy. It felt like there were scenes missing. It felt like there was development missing. This felt like an unfinished book. It felt like a draft that could have been a thousand times better than it was. And I had the misfortune of reading all four of them. They literally read like a trashy teen drama show. And they shouldn't have even been four books, to be honest. The first three books could have been combined and fleshed out a little bit for a better and stronger standalone, and book four shouldn't have existed at all. Book four really felt like an add-on, like an afterthought, 
and I hated every second of it. So let's just move on to happier times. After the absolute torture of having to read the Vampire Diaries series, and I say have to even though I was the one who forced myself to do this, whatever, I decided to read Erotic Stories for Punjabi Widows by Bali Kaur Jaswal. This book takes place in London and follows Nikki, the daughter of Indian immigrants who has spent her entire life distancing herself from the traditional Sikh community. When Nikki's father dies unexpectedly, however, she ends up impulsively deciding to teach a creative writing class at the Punjabi Community Center in order to earn a little bit more money and help out her family. Some miscommunication occurs and the women who show up to the class are expecting a basic English literacy course. One thing leads to another and Nikki discovers that what these very proper widows are actually interested in doing is talking about erotic stories. Nikki decides to encourage this interest but the class has to be very careful to keep this a secret from the Brotherhood, a group of highly conservative men who act as the moral police for the community. There is also a mystery aspect to this book as Nikki learns more about the community and realizes that there might be more to the recent death of a young woman. I ended up giving this book four stars. I really enjoyed it and it was not at all what I expected. There are erotic stories written by the widows sprinkled throughout this book but they are separate from the plot and you can easily skip over it and not miss out on anything if you're not into that. I'm pretty neutral on it. The stories didn't do anything for me but they didn't bother me either. As a warning, be aware that they exist, especially if you decide to listen to the audiobook and you're not wearing headphones. Honestly, what shocked me was the amount of depth that this book has. Yes, on its surface, it's a book about widows writing erotic stories, but it's so much more than that. This is a book about women. It was funny, it was emotional, sometimes it was dark. You learn a lot about these women and how they've been treated and why they are who they are. I thought it was a great message of not judging a book by its cover because initially Nikki makes a lot of assumptions about these widows and about the traditional Sikh community, but these women call Nikki out 100% and she has to deal with the fact that she doesn't actually know how multifaceted and colorful this community and its people really are. Nikki has a lot of growth throughout this book. Honestly, I hated her character during the first half of this book because she was so judgmental. She's so prideful about being a modern woman that it really just makes her judgy and kind of mean sometimes. For example, her sister is seeking a traditional arranged marriage and Nikki is so unsupportive and judgmental of that even though it's literally none of her goddamn business. She was the same way with the widows and the other community women in judging them and their lifestyles and the choices they have made. But in reality, Nikki doesn't know anything about them. She doesn't know anything about the way they live or why they make the choices that they do. Thankfully, she does have character growth and I loved seeing her being confronted by her own ignorance and coming to terms with that and becoming a better person. I really loved seeing her relationship with the widows really develop. The widows overall are not as in-depth characters. You don't really see individual character growth, but they do all have distinct personalities and you really get to know a couple of them well. It's amazing to see the impact that these classes have not only on the women, but on the community as a whole. There's just a lot of growth, both in the people and the relationships, and it all happened so naturally. I thought this book was really well paced. I also love the mystery aspect of the book. It's not the most complicated mystery in the world. I wouldn't say it's very complicated at all, but there are a few secrets being kept simultaneously that kind of muddy the waters and make it more difficult to guess the actual truth. I definitely doubted my own conclusions until the very end. This book was a very real look at some of the issues that women go through. All of the secrets you learn are treated very respectfully. At no point did I feel like serious issues were being used for shock value or trivialized. The author did her best to really convey what women can go through and what those experiences are like. I got kind of emotional learning all of the secrets and hearing all of the stories behind the widows. Also, while these serious issues were happening within the specific community in this book, at no point does it feel like those issues are characteristic of everyone in the community. This book is really about not painting anybody in broad strokes and understanding that there is nuance within every community, nuance with every person. Obviously, I'm not a part of this community. I am not Sikh or Punjabi, so I can't speak on the authenticity of the representation in this book. If you look it up, however, there are own voices reviews and all of the ones that I've seen have been pretty positive. The next book that I read was Radio Silence by Alice Oseman. I give this book five stars. It might actually be my favorite book of the month. In this book, our main character Francis is obsessed with one thing, achieving academic excellence in order to go to Cambridge. Well, she's obsessed with two things because she also is in love with this podcast called University, which is hosted by a mysterious person known only as Radio. University is the one place where Frances feels like she can be her most weird full self until she meets Alid. I just loved this book so much. Out of all the books that I read this month, I think Radio Silence had the most emotional impact on me. This was one of those rare, rare occasions where I finished a book and immediately wanted to start rereading it. I just thought it was so beautifully written. It's not a complex writing style, but it's so raw and authentic. I thought Alice Oseman did a very great job of portraying teenagers and how they actually act and interact with each other. I will say though, I think this book is more character driven than it is plot driven. There is 
is some plot. There's a little bit of a mystery, but overall the plot's a little weak and slow paced. The ending and the resolution, while nice, were a little bit anticlimactic. But those are the only real flaws that I can think of. And honestly, it didn't bother me. Normally this would, because I prefer plot driven stories, but pacing and mystery aside, there was a journey in this book. It was just mainly an emotional one. Radio silence got me so close to crying. If I wasn't actively washing dishes at the time, maybe I would have cried at one particular heart to heart scene between Francis and another character, Daniel. It was beautifully done. And I highly recommend listening to the audiobook of this book because that scene was performed with perfection. The actor in general did an amazing job of portraying emotion. Overall, the characters were well done. I thought they all had depth and they all had their own character growth that developed naturally. The relationships between all the characters are interesting, but the relationship between Francis and Alid was by far my favorite. I was honestly so worried at the start of the book thinking that this is going to be another one of those situations where it's a boy and a girl and they become friends. And obviously because they're a boy and a girl, they're going to fall in love and be a couple and, you know, heteronormative things like that. But not at all. Not in this book, not even a little bit. Their relationship was entirely platonic and I loved seeing their friendship develop. Not only did it show that people of opposite genders can be friends, obviously, but it also showed that platonic relationships could be just as important and have emotions just as deep and powerful as romantic ones. Their friendship and support for each other was amazing. Reading about it was honestly comforting. And of course they had their rocky moments, which I think is so important to show because no relationship is perfect smooth sailing. There was some hurt that occurred both in their relationship and in the relationship between other characters. And you get to see these characters try to repair the damages done and care for each other so strongly and try to do what's best for each other. Radio Silence also dealt with some heavy topics. Like I mentioned in the beginning of the video, all content warnings can be found in the description, but the ones that you should be most aware of are child abuse and depression. I really don't have much to say about that. I just wanted to warn you that those exist and they're pretty present. I think Alice Oseman portrayed those topics as authentically as she could, and it had a lot of emotional impact. I thought it was done respectfully, but it's definitely not something that you can avoid or skim over. Be aware of that. Another major theme of this book is not knowing what to do with your life at all. Francis experiences a lot of academic pressure. And to be fair, most of the pressure is that which she puts on herself. Her mother is very supportive and does remind her to take care of herself and do things just to make herself happy instead of always focusing on school, which I found very refreshing. There are plenty of parents who don't think their kids should have that much academic pressure, but I feel like it's rare to see a parent who recognizes what these teenagers are doing to themselves and tries to remind them, hey, take a step back, take care of yourself, do something that makes you happy and isn't just for academic success. Most of the characters in this book are about to graduate high school or recently graduated high school. And in their world, in their community, college is pushed very hard upon them. And studying a practical major within college is also pushed on them a lot. A lot of the characters experience the same struggle of knowing that you have to take the next step in your life, but not quite knowing what that step should be and what step is the best for them. Radio Silence had a great message of saying that not everyone's path looks the same. Not everyone is meant to go to college. Not everyone is meant to study a practical major. It's okay to focus on art or whatever makes you happy. It's okay not to go to college. None of that makes you a failure. That's what this book was saying. If you are a high school student getting to the age where you would start applying to college, I highly recommend reading Radio Silence. It'll really make you consider your own feelings and consider what is actually best for you and what would make you happy. I recently graduated college and even I found so much value in having that discussion because obviously I need to figure out what my next step in life is and I don't know. And it's okay not to know. I just love this book. I'm definitely going to be reading more of Alice Oseman's books because they it was just beautiful. I loved it. I'm so emotionally attached to this now. Oh, also, A plus LGBT representation. This book was the first time that I read the word demisexual in popular media and I was shocked. Oseman did a great job of representing the different sexualities that are present in this book. 10 out of 10, I can't recommend Radio Silence enough. Throughout the month of October, I also read the first five books of the Vampire Academy series by Rochelle Mead. I'm not going to hold them all up, but if my memory serves me, first book is Vampire Academy, second book is Frostbite, third is Shadow Kissed, Yes. Fourth is Blood Promise, and then the fifth book is Spirit Bound. In the Vampire Academy world, vampires are divided into subsets. You have the Dampiers, who are half human, half vampire. You have the Maroi, who are mortal vampires. And you have the Stragoi, who are immortal and the most dangerous. Vampire Academy centers around two girls, Lisa Dragomir, who is Maroi royalty, being hunted down by Stragoi, and Rose Hathaway, her best friend, who has dedicated her life to protecting Lisa. The book begins when Rose and Lisa are taken to St. Vladimir's Academy, a school for Maroi vampires and their protectors. 
characters. I gave the first book three stars, book two and three got four stars, book four went up to five stars, and then we were back to four stars with Spirit Bound. Not gonna lie, I went into these books expecting a trashy vampire romance series. This is actually a reread for me. I loved this series when I was younger and I was really worried about rereading it because I didn't expect it to hold up. I didn't expect it to be as good as I remembered it and I had nothing to worry about. They are so much better than I remember them being. Like I mentioned when I was talking about the Vampire Diaries series, I am planning to do a video on classic teen vampire series, so I'm not gonna go too into depth on a reviewing Vampire Academy. What I will say is that I think the major reason why this series is so much better than I expected it to be is because romance is not the only thing here. That's the way I remember it, but that's doing a disservice to this series. There is a lot of romance, it has a major impact on everything, but there's so much more to it than that. The platonic relationships, especially the one between Rose and Lisa, are just as important in the plot. Ultimately, Rose's main goal in life isn't to be in love, it's to be a guardian and to protect Lisa. And there is so much plot in this series beyond romance. You have characters learning more about themselves and what they're capable of. You have political intrigue and possible corruption in the Maroi government. You have plots and schemes and wild plans. You have a super expansive world that literally goes all the way to Siberia and back. I'm in the middle of the last book now and I'm still learning new things about this world. Every character has their own goals and existence outside of romance. Which is not to say the romances aren't good. I actually really loved all of the romances in this series. The main romance is questionable, without a doubt. I don't really consider this a spoiler because it's laid out pretty early in the book, but if you don't want to know anything about the main romance, you don't want to know who's involved, just skip ahead. So the main romance occurs between Rose and her mentor, Dimitri. At the time, Rose is 17 and Dimitri is 24. Obviously this is problematic on several levels. Obviously there's the age difference. Rose is literally a minor. There's also the power imbalance because Dimitri is her instructor and he does have some authority over her. I was initially uncomfortable with this and I'm still pretty conflicted about it. If this was real life and not a book, 100% against it, no question about it. But this is a book, it is fake. And the fact that all of those issues are addressed makes it a little bit easier to swallow. They have feelings for each other, but they do put an active effort in to ignoring those feelings and just acting like colleagues and friends. Dimitri, I would say, puts in most of the effort into putting his foot down and saying that any relationship between them would be inappropriate for the reasons already be listed. At no point are either of those aspects pushed aside or treated like they're not a big deal. I do also feel like Dimitri and Rose, for the most part, treat each other like equals, and that does go a long way towards making me feel less uncomfortable. Do I personally feel like they should be endgame? Well, watch out for that upcoming vampire video that I mentioned, and I'll tell you then. But overall, I think these books are very good. There are some things that kind of feel like they were thrown in just for the sake of advancing the plot. There are some things that feel a little bit like an afterthought, but it's not too jarring, and I feel like it's easily ignored. These books are just entertaining. They're fast-paced. There's a lot to learn. There is some humor and some growth with all the characters. If you like vampires at all, definitely try out this series. You might like it more than you thought you would. <laughs> and now we're moving on to all of the books that I read during Fortnite Frights. If you're unaware, during the last two weeks of October, I did participate in the Fortnite Frights readathon. I do have a vlog that went up on Halloween, so if you're interested in seeing my reactions to these books as I was reading them, make sure to check that out. But anyway, the very first book that I read was Cemetery Boys by Aiden Thomas, which I gave five stars to. Cemetery Boys is an unvoices book about a trans boy named Yadriel who is seeking approval from his community. Yadriel comes from a community of Bruhex who have the ability to interact with spirits. Supposedly only the men have the ability to summon spirits, however, so when Yadriel's cousin dies, Yadriel decides to summon his spirit, one, to figure out how he died, and two, to prove that he's a boy. Instead, Yadriel accidentally summons the spirit of Julian, the resident bad boy. Unfortunately for Yadriel, Julian is refusing to go on to the other side, so Yadriel reluctantly agrees to help him tie up some loose ends. Cemetery Boys was very funny, so much funnier than I expected going into it. It's pretty hard for a book to actually get me to laugh, and this book did it multiple times. I loved the interactions between Yadriel and Julian. I thought they had such great chemistry, and I love that they had a solid foundation for a friendship before it ever became more than that. When I first picked up this book, I was interested to see how a romance would play out, because obviously Julian is dead, so that's a bit of a relationship hurdle to get over. And if you're looking for a book with a super intense, very prominent romance, this is not the one for you. I think this is solidly a romance book, but that's not the main point of the plot. They have a whole murder to solve. They have other problems. <laughs> Personally, those are the kinds of romances that I love the most, where characters have their own goals and purposes outside of love. I want them to exist outside of romance, and Yadriel and Julian definitely did. I think that made their feelings for each other so much more natural and beautiful. Honestly, Aiden Thomas has a gift for conveying emotion and developing relationships. I mentioned in my Fortnite Frights vlog that I wouldn't describe his writing as masterful, and I do stand by that. When I say masterful writing, I'm referring to books that feel like a work of art in and of itself. 
skills. I'm talking about writing that is beautiful and transforms language. That's not how I would describe Cemetery Boys, and I think the book is better for it. I love lyrical writing, but I think pretty words would have just distracted from the messages that this book was trying to get across. I think Aidan Thomas did a great job of focusing on the characters and the relationships, and it makes the book feel more real and raw. And this book had plenty of very real topics to discuss. Obviously, the main focus is Yadriel's struggle to be accepted by his community as a boy. I loved that there was such nuance in this situation. If people are being outright blatantly transphobic and mean, it's so easy to look at that and say that it's wrong. But that was not this situation. I don't think anyone who has read this book would say that Yadriel's family didn't love him. They do love him, and to an extent, they try to understand or at least appease him. What this book addresses is more so the microaggressions, the transphobia that's more subtle and easier to dismiss or forgive because, you know, they're trying. They don't mean to hurt you. There was such a wonderful moment where Yadriel's father attempts to apologize for something hurtful that he had said, and Yadriel, even though he loves his dad and understands that his dad loves him too, still refuses to say that it's okay. Because it's not okay. Transphobia is transphobia, regardless of the levels or how it presents itself or who it comes from. By having those harmful things mostly come from Yadriel's own community, I think Cemetery Boys does a better job of showing how pervasive and hurtful transphobia can be. And I so, so appreciate how everyone is held accountable for their actions. So often in books and real life, you see adults and especially parents get away with saying so many hurtful things because they're adults and they don't feel a need to apologize to children. In Cemetery Boys, every time something hurtful is said or done, the person is held accountable. Whether it's Yadriel's family saying something transphobic or it's Julian letting his anger get the best of him. The characters are forced to look at themselves and their own actions, to own their actions and apologize, and most importantly, to grow and do better. There is so much character growth in this book. Even Yadriel has to take a good look at himself and his own motivations at some point. He's trying so hard to prove that he's a boy to his community, and at some point he has to grapple with the idea that no, he doesn't have to prove himself to anyone, but that doesn't change the fact that he wants to belong. There are some complicated emotions in this book about wanting to belong to a community that doesn't fully accept you, which is why I say Aiden Thomas has such a gift for conveying emotion. These are complex emotions, but I felt them all. I yearned with these characters, I hurt with them, I fell in love with them, and honestly, I almost cried with them. While overall it was a really fun read, as the story progresses, it does veer more towards sad and bittersweet. My only real qualm with Cemetery Boys is that the plot was pretty predictable. I guessed every plot twist and the exact ending before I even got to the halfway mark, to be honest. Of course, this is a YA book and I'm not a teenager anymore, but I do feel like I'm close enough in age to the demographic that if I can figure it out, they can figure it out too. So I wouldn't suggest you going into this and expecting a mind-blowing, shocking ending. Go into this expecting to grow and empathize and learn about the lives of other people. Go into this expecting to learn a little bit about Latinx culture and about this super cool world of spirits. And definitely go into this expecting a really cute romance. The next thing that I read was volume one of Something is Killing the Children by James Tiny and the Fourth. This is a horror comic that takes place in the town of Archer's Peak where children are either disappearing or being brutally murdered. The few who survive have horrifying stories of a monster. Enter Erica Slaughter who has spent her entire life killing monsters. I gave this comic two stars. I didn't enjoy it as much as I expected to. I thought the premise was interesting but volume one really just dragged on. It took a long while for anything to really happen. The characters all felt pretty one-dimensional and some of the actions that they took were just questionable and didn't make sense. I don't know. I just felt very disconnected from this comic. There was no emotional impact for me, honestly. I also didn't really vibe with the art style of this comic. It had a very rough, sort of grungy look to it, which admittedly does match the atmosphere of the comic, but I just wasn't a fan of it. Plus, the monster, once you actually see it, doesn't look very original at all. It reminded me a lot of the monster from Stranger Things. Erica Slaughter's character design was scarier than the monster, to be honest, and maybe this was intentional, but the point is that neither the plot nor the art scared me at all. It was only at the very end of volume one where my interest was kind of peaked a little bit because you got a glimpse into the world that Erica Slaughter came from, but my interest was not peaked enough to continue reading this comic. If you want to read it, this comic does get pretty gory, so be prepared for that imagery. All right, so my battery died and I had to recharge it, but I didn't recharge it all the way, so we're going to do a little bit of a power speed mode, all right? 
The next book that I read was The Year of the Witching by Alexis Henderson, which I gave four stars to. In this book, our main character, Emmanuel, lives in a very strict religious community where her very existence as a biracial woman is considered disgraceful. When Emmanuel finds herself in the Forbidden Woods surrounding this town, she runs into the spirits of witches that have long been dead. These witches give to her the diary of her dead mother. With this diary, Emmanuel starts learning some dark secrets about her mother and the church. Honestly, there's a huge chance that I'll change this rating to five stars because thinking back on it, it's possible that I gave it four star for somewhat petty reasons, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Now, how to describe the vibe of this book? I want to say that it feels like a mixture between Handmaid's Tale, Penny Dreadful, and Sabrina. If anyone has seen these shows and read this book, please comment below and let me know if you agree. Basically, this book has a gritty, dark atmosphere to me. There are some gothic elements. Alexis Henderson doesn't shy away from going a little dark. I thought the plot was very well paced and intense, and there are some gruesome parts that happen. I personally felt more uneasy than I did scared, which I think was the intention. I don't think Henderson wanted you to feel scared out of your mind. I think she wanted you to feel anxious, especially if you're a woman, because the women in this book go through a lot of mistreatment. The way women are mistreated and how complacent the community is in the mistreatment of women is honestly the most frightening thing about this book. Definitely, definitely check out the trigger warnings for this book, because like I said, Henderson does not shy away from some hard Hard topics. I'm a generally desensitized person. Not a lot of things hit me hard, to be honest, and even I had some trouble reading through some of the passages and some of the things that the women in this book go through. 100% the scariest things that happened in this book were perpetrated by humans and not the witches, which I think says a lot. I thought there was a lot of depth with what was happening in this book. Initially, the witches are cast as 100% evil, 100% the villains, but you do get to learn a little bit more about them and maybe even sympathize with them a little bit. You definitely start to question whether the real villains are actually the town people who either actively participate or are complacent in all of the horrible things that happen. It sends a very stark message on just how much evil humans are capable of. And I think that's why I gave it four stars instead of five stars. I wanted the fight against those evils to be so much harsher and darker than it actually was. If you've read this book, you can probably imagine what I wanted to happen in the ending. Henderson does toy a bit with rage and with Emmanuel going a little bit dark, but I wanted her to go so much harder. At no point did I ever doubt what side Emmanuel would choose in the end. She was always cast to be a hero, albeit one with a dark streak, but I wanted more of an anti-hero. At the very end, Henderson pulled back instead of leaning into the darkness, and while I understand that that's a better message for people to learn, it's just not as interesting to me. Overall, it was a great story and an interesting world. The plot of this book felt very well resolved, and although there is a setup for a sequel, I'm also satisfied if it was just a standalone. I am glad there is going to be a sequel though, because I admittedly had a lot of questions about the world in general, and a sequel would give the characters more opportunity to have development. The lack of real character development and multifaceted characters was one of the things that this book was lacking for me. The next book that I read was actually an anthology titled Three Messages and a Warning. This is an anthology of fantastical stories written by Mexican authors, and I gave this four stars. I don't know quite how to describe this to be honestly, but luckily there is a line in this book that I think sums it up pretty nicely. The line in the book says, you descended from the car and returned to your house, feeling that you inhabit the world of the story. The air transforms formed by its pages into a terrible, kind sorrow enveloping your breast. While there are some stories that veered a little bit into scary and unsettling, overall I felt more melancholic and sad. If you're new to horror stories, this might be a good option for you because it kind of gently eases you in to being scared. There really is no other way to sum them up besides saying that they are fantastical stories. Overall, they're very intriguing and they do leave me with questions, but I'm also entirely satisfied with the fact that I don't have all the answers. This anthology also deals with a lot of topics such as love, death, politics, etc. If you read this in order, this anthology can be quite the journey through human life and emotions. My absolute favorite short story in this book was Wittgenstein's Umbrella by Oscar de la Borboya, which I think was a great story about how your choices and the choices of other people can have such a major impact on your life, no matter how small the choice was. And the final book that I read during October was Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia. In this book, our main character Noemi received a concerning letter from her recently wedded cousin begging for her help. So Noemi decided decides to travel to their mansion in the countryside, but when she gets there, her cousin denies anything being wrong. Ultimately, Noemi finds herself stuck in this house full of secrets that she has to uncover. Honestly, this book was kind of a disappointment for me. I ended up giving it three stars, which isn't a bad rating at all. It's an average rating. It was an okay book. In all fairness, Mexican Gothic didn't get the best chance because it's been so hyped on the booktube community that I went into it with really high expectations and I just found it lacking. What I will say is that Silver Moreno Garcia is amazing at setting a 
a scene. She truly built a gothic atmosphere and setting, and she's very descriptive. I could see everything that she wanted me to see. But I also felt like there was a lack of subtlety in setting up the novel. There were several moments where we were told straight out what kind of person a character is. We're told in a sentence or two basically everything you need to know about Noemi's personality. We're also told straight out that something is gothic or it's directly compared to a gothic novel. Personally, I felt like we were being told what the book is rather than it just being what it is. Mexican Gothic was also a slower pace than I prefer, but in all fairness, that does seem to be characteristic of gothic novels. I'm not docking any points for that. However, that being said, Mexican Gothic didn't really capture my interest and compel me to keep reading until the very last 40 to 30% of the book. That is a common criticism that I've seen amongst other people who have reviewed the book, and I really don't think you should have to get through the majority of the book to get to the parts that are really good. The horror also wasn't to my taste. This is obviously a very subjective thing. What's scary to me isn't going to be scary to other people. It just depends. Mexican Gothic relies mostly on physical horror, whereas I think I prefer psychological horror. Like I mentioned in my vlog, I want horror slash thriller books to make me feel anxious. I want it to get in my head. This book just didn't do that. I felt very disconnected to the plot and the characters in general. I do think it would do an awesome job at scaring other people though. I understand why people love it. It's very atmospheric. It has a great aesthetic to it. The characters are intriguing to a degree, although I thought they were generally one dimensional. I will say though, the Doyle family did elicit some emotion. Sylvia Moreno Garcia managed to get me very angry every single time that family showed up on the page. She also did manage to make me kind of uncomfortable with some of the things that happened in the book. So while I was generally disconnected, she did manage to draw me in and get me to feel things at certain points. The plot twist at its core wasn't very original, but Sylvia Moreno Garcia did take it and made it her own in a very unique way that I've never seen before. So I do commend her for that. The only thing that I think wasn't redeemable at all and that I can't see why people would enjoy it is honestly the romance. I didn't think there was any chemistry between the two love interests. They just fell into each other because they were both trapped in this situation and they could only find allies in each other. So I just felt like they would have been better friends. Those are all the books that I read in October. My camera battery is dying, so I'm gonna need to end this here. If you have read any of the books that I mentioned, please comment below and let me know what you think. In the meantime, if you're looking for more bookish content, make sure to subscribe because I do post a new video every Wednesday and Saturday. I'll see you in the next one. Also, a little fun fact, you can tell which videos I filmed on the same day based entirely on my lipstick. I change my outfit. Most of the time I change my hair, but you can tell based on my makeup because I'm not gonna change that. So points to whoever can guess which other video I filmed today.